From the top down, government officials say they need to work as quickly as possible to reopen the port of Baltimore after last week's collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. This as President Biden plans to visit the site this week. Connor Hansen has more. Days after one of Baltimore's iconic bridges came crashing down into one of the country's most vital shipping lanes, it's still unclear how long it will take to reopen the channel. Two massive cranes are being brought in to lift tons of steel and debris out of Baltimore Harbor. A portion of the bridge beneath the water has been described by, Uni by Unified Command as chaotic wreckage. President Biden has vowed federal support and plans to visit the site of the collapsed bridge Friday. We are going to do everything that we can uh, to make sure that that bridge gets back up. So far, the Department of Transportation has allocated $60 million to get cleanup efforts started. The White House has been talking to the state of Maryland about how much the entire project will cost and how much more will be needed from Congress. I also spoke with the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson over the weekend who understands the significance of this. In the meantime, hundreds of ships are being rerouted. I'm proud to announce that we do in fact have an 11 foot channel now just to the north. And thousands of workers at the closed port are unsure about their future employment is to do everything that we can to make sure that, uh, that, that, that we mitigate um, the anxiety and the harms of this moment, including um, the economic security of workers. It's still unclear how long it could take to build a new bridge. The Francis Scott Key Bridge took about five years to build in the 1970s. In New York, Connor Hansen, Fox News. With more on the bridge collapse and its impact on the supply chain, I'm joined by EKA partner and former Port of Long Beach Managing Director for Trade, Alex Charon. Uh, sir, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Let's start on the East Coast and the economic impact that that is having with the port closure. Yeah, so the real immediate concerns, obviously, you know, the longer that the Port of Baltimore remains closed, you know, the more pressure there will be to find alternative gateways. And so shippers and shipping uh, companies right now are scrambling to look for alternative uh, routes. And that will, in the short term, you know, mostly be East Coast ports, Savannah, Jacksonville. Um, we won't see a real large diversion um, for, for probably three to six months. Okay. And, and then just noting that Baltimore's port imported and exported more automobiles than any other in the U.S. Can you speak to the auto industry? Sure. It's, you know, it's a, obviously a very niche segment of um, the supply chain, but, you know, you've got to remember the entire supply chain um, is interconnected. And so if there's no facility available to either onload or offload um, automobiles on the East Coast, uh, there aren't, you know, very many other ports that can accommodate that. You have to have the cranes, you have to have the infrastructure, you have to have the workforce capable to do that. And so, um, you know, th that area was pretty dependent on the Port of Baltimore to uh, process that type of cargo. So you mentioned short term, we're talking uh, three to six months that uh, other East Coast ports will see more traffic. Uh, you're very familiar with the ports here, especially uh, Long Beach. How will we be impacted? You know, again, I don't think for three to six months we'll see much of an impact. Um, however, at that point, you know, and again, this is all dependent on however long it takes to reopen the Port of Baltimore. You know, the longer that goes on, you know, the more attractive some of these other gateways are going to be, including uh, the West Coast ports. Now, granted, it's much more expensive to ship those goods and reroute them from the East Coast to the West Coast. Um, shippers have options in, you know, Gulf Coast ports uh, in Houston uh, and elsewhere. Uh, but at some point, you know, given uh, the whatever the price of fuel will be, whatever the sort of the availability will be for rail, you know, if you're trying to get cargo to the middle of this country, uh, it, the math may make sense to divert it to the West Coast. And again, these decisions in the supply chain, because there's limited capacity, um, you know, because it's a fluid situation, these have to be made. These decisions have to be made months in advance. So again, three to six months, I think you're, you're going to see short-term diversion to other East Coast ports. Uh, six months thereafter, if the Port of Baltimore isn't back and operating at full capacity, you may see that potential for that cargo to be diverted here. And then I'm thinking of Christmas, uh, you know, that'll put us in October, November. Yeah, you know, again, those plans are made months in advance. And, you know, believe me, shippers overseas, importers, exporters here, um, you know, anyone involved in the logistics industry, 
everyone has their eyes on that holiday shipment season. You see a surge, obviously, in container activity. And if one port in this entire network goes down, you will see the ripple effect. Okay, we're going to end it after this one here because this is a ripple effect and sort of a secondary effect. It's not just the port, but then the rail and actually delivering this cargo. Sure. So, you know, the, the supply chain is not just the ships. It's, you know, the trucks that haul it to local warehouses. It's the rail, uh, to your point, and then that last mile delivery. So, and again, because there's limited capacity in this country, if one port goes down, you will feel that impact at every other port. It's just a matter of when. All right. Well, I learned a lot. Uh, I think our viewers did too. Alex Sharon, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you.